Uh, welcome back to this Wednesday's uh, webinar. And I am going to very quickly get out of the way. We have Professor Leslie DeChurch, who teaches um, classes on collaborative leadership in both the custom and hybrid program. Today, going to talk to us about, you can see right there on the screen, teaming in a virtual world. Leslie, welcome. Thank you. I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, this is a pure joy webinar for me because ever since the pandemic started, um, when you're the person who studies teams and leadership, people ask you, you know, what advice do you have for working virtually, right? Virtual teams just became not a nice to have, but an essential competency that everybody has to have. Um, and so coincidentally, uh, Nashir Contractor, who you've also met uh, on one of the other webinars, and you're going to hear from him more next week, we have been working with NASA very closely for the past eight years, studying people in what we thought were the most extreme environments on Earth and off Earth. And what we learned is that actually a lot of the insights um, that have come from our space search and so what I'm going to do today is leave you with takeaways um, that work. So as for what we're going to talk about. Um, humans are on the brink of becoming interdisciplinary. This is the bold vision of the future of setting up, you know, not just sending uh, a small crew of people to go and kind of plant a couple flags, but rather to, to colonize. NASA has outlined a plan for how we're going to get to Mars. And you'll notice in this document, I circled uh, a box that is red. It says requires mitigation. Uh, NASA being very engineering minded, when they set off a new mission goal, they outline all of the risks. So what are the reasons why this effort could fail? And you'll notice at the top of the screen, it says risk of performance and behavioral health decrements due to inadequate cooperation, coordination, communication within a team. And so teamwork, virtual teamwork, is one of the mission uh, risk factors. And so that's kind of the background for why we've been studying teams in this environment. To give you a little bit of an awe for the, the sense of challenge that this poses, a mission to Mars is a 259 day operation. Um, to illustrate why, we have a little bit of our galaxy, the sun, is the Earth, all Mars and we're on different orbits. So there are certain times of the year where Mars and Earth are very far away and other times where they're closer. This is the orbit that we have to follow. Um, now I'm going to ask you a question. In a 10-year period, how many launch windows um, do you think there are where we can make this orbit work to go to Mars? And don't be shy, you can just shout it out. 10. 10, another guess? One. Like it? 20 from 10. Okay, so we have one, we have 10, we have 20. You guys are pretty good. Um, this is the launch schedule. You don't have to read the tiny print, but if you look at the top, it's essentially about five. Um, so we're not that far off. Right? Basically, every two years, there's a window that opens where if you launch in that window, uh, you can go to Mars. Now, guess what? We're in that window right now. So tomorrow morning at about 7 a.m. Eastern time is the launch of the Mars 2020 mission. Um, this is a pre-positioning uh, technology mission. Uh, we're sending a rover called Perseverance. And one of the coolest parts of Perseverance is it has a little portable um, oxygen making machine on board. This technology was developed at MIT and it can take Mars's atmosphere in and emit breathable air. So we all in Chicago, especially in Evanston in the winter, we have these little space heaters. Imagine one of those that's just making it so that you can breathe normally on another planet. Um, so that's my plug for tune in tomorrow morning for the exciting launch of the next Mars mission. Um, Mars is, is really far. Um, when it comes to teamwork, far has a number of effects. So the actual communication 
treated to your team may be different time zones or different parts of the globe, but there's very little delay. If you try to get on a Zoom call, even if somebody's sleepy and somebody else isn't, right, you still have the ability to talk in real time with almost no detection of a lag. That's not the case, right? So one of the biggest challenges is the fact that the distance creates a degree of autonomy. Um, this is a former cosmonaut who, in talking about this autonomy, said, you know, all the conditions necessary for murder are met if you shut two men in a cabin, 18 by 20, and leave them together for two months. Um, so hence the, what we call affectionately, team risk in a Mars mission. Um, so our main question that we've been working on is what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement? And wouldn't it be nice be able to make them in ways, make them do really complicated and also extremely boring and repetitive tasks, monitor them uh, physiologically, but also have them do unlimited surveys. Remember the Stanford prison experiments uh, where Zimbardo, you know, had the guards and the prisoners? This perhaps would be Zimbardo's dream. Um, we actually have this. Uh, so in preparation for a Mars mission, space agencies around the world, as we speak, are doing extreme isolation experiments where small teams of people are going into chambers that look something like this, like a little RV camper. This one is in Houston. And they go in for 45 days so that they can team. This last, uh, and this is a crew that we studied for 120 days. They were on a 10 minute communication delay um, in complete isolation and confinement with very boring uh, food supplies. Um, there are also others. The Chinese have the Lunar Palace, Japan has an isolation chamber, and the European Space Agency has the best analogs ever. They're in, uh, in Sardinia and um, the Rio Tinto Desert in Spain, uh, otherwise beautiful locations. Um, and so my question to you is, can you imagine living and working while socially isolated from your friends and family, confined to a small space, under conditions that make it hard to work, like sleep deprivation, extended period of time? I think we can all imagine it. Um, so one of the, again, I said this is really a joy to talk about right now because um, for the past eight years, I've been studying these extreme teams that are no longer extreme, right? They're representative of what we're all basically doing right now. So what I've distilled out are five uh, research-based principles to make five lessons from the our team today. Um, the first lesson, if you're not with the team you love, then love the team you're with. Um, I'm shamelessly stealing the old, uh, the old expression. So one of the things about a Mars mission is you don't get to change your team. Um, once the mission launches, the team is fixed. And many of us have similar challenges in our teams, right? We have hiring restrictions. Um, we have people that we're kind of fixed working with. And it's created all sorts of new um, people that have to coordinate that maybe don't have established working relationships, but because of the crisis have to work together. Um, because we have this problem acutely with NASA, one of the things that we have found is that you can literally repair um, crews. And so there's always some people in the team who are more compatible than other people. In the team, um, most, but you can 
making some jobs to identify what your optimal, we call them critical pairs are, people who are the most compatible and structure the work, recognizing that the team will be more active when those people are working on the interdependent tasks. Um, so who should we pair on the most interdependent tasks? Um, we did an experiment last year where we took the analog crews that NASA was going to put in isolation. We gave them a four hour battery of every uh, important psychological trait you can imagine. And we ran a computational model that would predict the quality of crew relationships throughout the 45 days. If we took the most interdependent work and gave it to these people versus these people. And the fun thing about these Petri dishes is that you can turn it on and off. So we put the best people together, watched what happened, then we put the worst people together. And my best didn't come. Well, should you put the compatible people together or is it better to kind of force the non-compatible people together? Um, does anyone want to guess? So the, the conclusion is, don't put the integrate both, yes. So integrate both in the crew. Um, the crew is actually more integrated if you pair up the most compatible people on critical tasks, right? So when there is important, highly interdependent work, um, having people who are less compatible. Um, I see we're using the chat quite effectively. I love it. Um, yes, integrating both um, is very relevant to the conditions that we're having now. Okay, so that's our first lesson. Um, and the two outcomes that we found is that um, if, you, if you maximize the number of days where, where you put the it, positive day and we and about being in the mission. The second lesson is that there's a new team competency, um, which we call small group living. Um, in this era of work before COVID, many of us were taught that everything needed to be compartmentalized, right? We, we leave our, our family problems at home when we come to work, we focus on work, and then we turn it off and go home. And a lot of the research on work and family really emphasize the importance and value of creating mental compartments where you can at work focus on work, at home focus on home. Um, interestingly though, with NASA, this doesn't work, right? There's no way to compartmentalize when the only people that you have are living with team. This is a job analysis that NASA, I, I had four different scenarios, scenario A, B, C, on how much, how closely you work together. These are the results of the competencies that you need to be an effective astronaut. On the left are small crews on big ships. All the way on the right are big crews on small ships, right? The idea is that the bigger the crew and the smaller the ship, the more tension that's going to develop and the more chance for the crew to fail. What you'll notice is I've circled in blue and put big yellow arrows to flag this competency that becomes critical for a Mars mission, right? And critical for us right now. Now, last year, Nishir and I flew to Houston after each astronaut came down from the space station and we put them out in their This team came when we made them work, we got these kinds of quotes. Well, we check, we have to check on each other constantly, right? Even not check like, are you having a bad mental health day? But as people are working, even if they're doing work that doesn't require one another, just making sure they're doing okay with it and recognizing when you need to provide some extra support or backup. That made the work a lot easier for everyone. Um, finding out who needed help and then doing simple things like on the space station, putting their tools away, right? But thinking about, well, I have extra resources right now. What can I do to help my teammates who maybe are in a, in a struggle? And then when I'm the one struggling, um, I know I can rely on them. Eating together, creating little rituals. Um, I know a lot, of, I've talked to a lot of teams who are doing this kind of thing where they'll create a coffee hour or 
um, you know, even a shared writing time where they'll kind of leave the Zoom open and it's just nice to have recreate that presence. Um, and then this was one of the astronauts, I'll, I'll let you guess who said it. If your buddy is eating a shit sandwich, eat it with them. It makes it easier. Um, and so, you know, somebody's in the space station got a problem, their a procedure's not working the way it should, or a part isn't where it's supposed to be, you know, kind of stopping what you're doing and helping them um, so that you're kind of bearing the brunt of that together. So this brings us to our third lesson. Um, time matters. Uh, any of you who are sports fans, I know we haven't had a lot of sports lately, but if you watch football or you watch basketball or soccer, you know that that clock is critical, right? It's not just about what the score is at the moment, it's about how much time is left in the game. So in psychology, in studying teams, there's something called a third quarter phenomenon. Now the evidence varies um, about whether it's exactly in the third quarter, but the point is that people's performance is not constant, right? Being right at a deadline or right near the end of the game You'll often watch, you know, if you watch football, whole, you know, people this way also. So the third quarter phenomenon has been found basically where you're after a deadline, but you're not close to another deadline. Um, morale and performance can suffer. There's an expression. Um, there's nothing more dangerous than a 200 hour pilot, right? Out of the phase where, you know, you're really vigilant and thinking about everything you're doing, but not with a sense of urgency. Um, these are some of our uh, data that we've been collecting in these analogs. And you don't have to look at the nitty gritty, but what that blue line is, is the performance of the team over time, right? So. And the figure on the top, you can see that this is decision making, uh, using di distributed expertise to make a correct decision. Um, the, te the teams are getting better and then they're getting worse, right? The second one is probably the third worse, and then they're getting a little bit better. The reason why I'm bringing this up is it's valuable in our work teams to recognize the effect of extreme environments and isolation on the performance of people over time, right? And so one of the things that leaders can do is exert some control over the situation, creating a clock uh, where one doesn't exist. This is a little excerpt that I pulled from the end. This was a recent review on third quarter research and they bring up this issue of open-ended missions. This is what we're in right now, an open-ended mission, right? If I ask, you know, if we did a quick poll right now, when is this gonna end, right? There's a wide variation. Some people think it's October, some people think it's January, some people think it's never, right? Um, I hope it's not never. But the point is that we don't have a mission clock. And there is exerting yourself clock's gonna do I burst and put in all my energy right now, or do I kind of conserve until it's the end of the game? Right. And I think that's one of the acute challenges that we're all facing is that in our teams, people need clocks, right? They need to entrain themselves and their patterns to something. And that's something that leaders can create, right? Even if it's not the real clock, get everybody on the same page so that the perception of time is the same. We're working towards fall. <laughs> We're going to talk about September 1st. We're going to do everything we need to do to meet this deadline. When we get to September 1st, we'll do the next thing. Um, so that brings me to the fourth lesson, which is create structure and meaningful routines. Um, the Um, this is a photograph of Ernest Shackleton's voyage. So to put it in context a little bit, Ernest Shackleton was a very proud British fellow, uh, British and Irish, and he wanted so badly 
to kind of win the glory of Antarctica, to be the first explorer to reach the South Pole for England. And he failed. Um, he, um, he lost to the Norwegian skis using dogs to assist them. To the Norwegians, but I'm going to bring back the glory of England. We are going to be the first team to land on one side of the continent and walk across the entire continent. Okay, that was an important goal. Well, they set off on their voyage and they get stuck in the ice in the Weddell Sea and they end up watching, getting off the ship and basically watching their ship sink, right? They're not going to make it even too. Antarctica, let alone claim this kind of glory. This is a quote from Shackleton's diary. A man must shape himself to a new mark directly. The old one goes to ground. One of the remarkable things when you look at Shackleton's voyage, he ended up saving the lives of all 28 members of the crew. So after spending more than a year in these horrible conditions stranded with apparently no hope, you say, how did he do that? And what you notice is that he was constantly setting a goal, right? So the first iceberg they, they were on, they called it, um, you know, hope. And then hope camp sank, pretty location. And he said, this is patience camp. Everybody gave them put a structure. I mean, they had nothing to do. They were just like us right now. Every day kind of, you know, this is the fourth March and every day feels like Wednesday. And is it morning, noon or night? We have no idea. But what's remarkable is it was like complete darkness. And here's Shackleton with these crew members. They've got nothing to do, right? They've got no hope of salvation, no cell phones, no equipment. But he was, he didn't have the whole plan set up, but he wasn't willing to give up. Right? So he took and he created structure. He made meaningful routines and micro goals that allowed everyone to keep proceeding. This is Scott Kelly. Uh, you probably remember Scott Kelly because he was the astronaut, the twin who went up in space for a year. And his twin, Mark, uh, who was also an astronaut, stayed on Earth and allowed us to get really great data comparing the effects of being on Earth or being in space for a year. And here's what he said in his book. us to a working life environment earth right the point here we actually have a lot more control than we think we do and that once we put that in place our body is naturally entrained to it um, it's critical to do that with teams and have everyone entrained to the same thing lesson five humor is actually a coping style so if you uh, are getting of these Zoom calls and people are bantering back and forth and you might be thinking, is this productive? Rest assured, you're actually contributing to the performance of your group. About able to diffuse tension release it and work productively and restore people's focus. So um, these are four different styles. Apparently, um, you'll be interested to know humor is not of one type or another. Psychologists have identified different kinds of humor that have different consequences for teams. So affiliative humor, right, is the kind of lighthearted jokes, um, and it creates sort of fellowship and well-being. I like to think that my, my uh, joke which was you know taking a social media meme about the fourth the fourth time it's march and every day is wednesday that's affiliative humor um that would be like the jerry seinfeld kind of humor we can we're laughing at you right and um, aggressive humor is actually detrimental to groups. Even if people laugh at it in the moment, which is bad because it reinforces the person using the aggressive humor, it makes people feel uncomfortable, right? It creates, um, if you've heard the term psychological safety, which we talk a lot about in the fall course, um, you know, an environment where people feel comfortable making a mistake, admitting that they don't know something, 
Um, that perception is critical for teams to be able to learn and improve. The next one is self-enhancing humor. This can also be positive. You know, this is the, um, you know, being able to laugh at yourself, right? So this is the mild, I think the Brits sort of um, so just the last is self-defeating humor, right? This is really demoralizing. Um, and it's, it's humor that's um, not so far off from self-enhancing because it's also kind of self-directed. Um, but the problem is it's undermining people's confidence in you. And it's usually a defense mechanism for being in the presence of a bully or somebody that's interpersonally aggressive, right? So in that case, it becomes dysfunctional to the group. Um, one of the interesting things is we've started measuring these humor styles in groups. Um, and they're actually quite, so not only is humor important, but it's, there are positive styles, so using more affiliative and self-enhancing humor. Um, and it's really bad if people use different humor styles, right? So if you have someone in the crew, someone in your group who's using kind of aggressive humor. Um, but who knew? Uh, they're, they're actually uh, psychological instruments that you can diagnose yourself, kind of preferred humor styles. Um, and this podcast in the Economist with session, we were talking about the jokester in Antarctica and some of these other settings. Um, so I leave you with this idea that yes, humans will become an interdisciplinary species. This goal is very exciting. But I also feel like at the same time, the universe has looked at all of us on Earth and said, guess what, humans? You're not going to Mars until you learn to collaborate virtually from all over the globe on the planet that you're on. Um, and so, you know, if you've ever heard of Gatorade or Tank, or Zero, these are how to do something really first. Um, one of the exciting things about this research is we're finding that there are some things that are really hard about teams living in these tiny spaces for long open-ended missions. And we go, ah, we can really use that. Um, so I've summarized them here. These are some of the things, hopefully you have um, a hack or two that you can use in your work teams or a new way to think about or frame something that you're experiencing. Thinking of ways to repair a team right? Literally changing up uh, who's working. Challenges are facing when they have extreme distraction, you know, children who can't go to school. Managing the third quarter or at least recognizing that there's everybody needs a clock, right? We can't just go on indefinitely without having some interim goals that are set um, by ourselves. Creating structure where there is none, right? We need to impose a structure. Um, and remembering that when all else fails, laugh about it. Um, make a joke, <laughs> lighten up, let everyone kind of diffuse the tension of the uncontrollable uh, to feel better and, and more in control. So, I'm just gonna leave you. I'll, I'll stay on if there's a quick question or two. Um, I'm sorry, we only have 30 minutes today. Um, but I wanna just say thank you all for joining me and um, hopefully you get something useful that you can take back to your teams. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, this was terrific. Um, my internet connection is in and out, so I hope everybody's hearing me okay, but um, uh, this was great information. I wish I had back in the middle of March, but something, uh, great lessons I'll certainly be uh, taking, taking forward with me. Um, so thank you very much to Leslie. And we hope to see you all next week. Um, the quick primer, I believe uh, Nashir said he's going to be talking about um, what he calls the ick factor of networking and getting past that, um, the uncomfortableness that can sometimes come with uh, initial reach out or connections and, and asking people for help um, and, uh, and have some data to share with us as well. So little primer for that next week. But again, thank you, Leslie. Thank you to everybody else for joining us today. And uh, hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.
keep teaming. 